Roddy, I, I found out about your, your book a little while ago. A friend recommended it to me because the subject of learning has been something I'm, I'm fascinated in. I've got a background in teaching. My wife's a mm -hmm. teacher. Um, but funny, the way it came up was I was, I was trying to get better at just memory, uh, memorizing people's names. I feel like I'll get into a conversation. I'll meet someone for the first time. I'll introduce myself and I'll go away and I'll go, oh my gosh, they just told me their name. I can't yeah. remember what it was. And I was, yeah. explaining, I was explaining this to a, a friend of mine a little while ago. They said, hey, you have to read this book, Make It Stick, because a, a lot of the, uh, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis are probably not helpful when it comes to this idea of learning and especially when it comes to this idea of memorizing mm -hmm. knowledge, information, people's names. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe a good way to kickstart the conversation would be to ask you the question, what are a couple of the biggest misconceptions when it comes to effective learning or memorizing of information? Okay, well, let's start with the problem you just mentioned, which you're not the only one who has this problem. Almost everyone does. And so um, the, there are some complicated techniques about remembering names and faces. I can get into that. But the simplest thing to do is as soon as you hear a name, I mean, you're all busy, you're shaking hands, smiling, trying to make a good impression, and so you're distracted. But the best thing you can do is mentally repeat it to yourself immediately. And then try, uh, if, if it's not awkward to use it in the conversation, well, well Betty, what do you think about so-and-so? Uh, and that way, uh, and then if you keep using it at, uh, intervals after that, you'll have the name. And so the main piece of advice there, which is hard to do, is pay careful attention in the first place, be, be effortful, be conscious, okay, I'm learning somebody new, and then repeat the name for yourself, and then, if you can, out loud. Um, yeah. So yeah, it... the... And so I'm going to a new class starting Monday. This is our beginning of our semester. And I'll have a bunch of students and I'll learn their names. And the way I do it every semester um, is just with flashcards. Just put the face. They, they give us all their pictures. Put the face on one side, the name on the other. And just keep practicing every day until I have them all. And then, of course, they don't look necessarily like what their picture was so you have that problem but that's pretty easily so so anyway and then i try uh even the first day of class to call them by name um, yeah so, so it's just that process of actually recalling their name in the moment you're right yeah. I, I notice that quite a lot I'm, I'm so concerned about making sure i get the handshake right making sure i'm <laughs> polite making sure I introduce anyone else that I'm with, that it's it's yeah. almost just a courtesy thing. <laughs> it's like we're yeah. just uh, scoping each other out. But the idea of actually memorizing the name is is probably yeah. not at the forefront of the mind. So the right. idea of it's just not. repeating it throughout that conversation, I notice yeah. it, it also seems quite personable. I notice whenever I meet someone and uh, I've just met them and they bring my name up in conversation, it seems like perhaps more than even just memorizing their name, it's it's just a nice personable way to kickstart yes, a conversation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now, there are people, uh, they're called memory athletes. I don't know if this is a popular, in, in the world of mind sports, mental sports, uh, memorizing is, uh, has a class of its own. And one of the tasks they have is to see names and faces one time. Uh, they go through a list of, say, 150 or 200. Name, face, one time. And then you got the face later in a random order, all the faces, and you have to come up with the names. It's one of the hardest tasks they have to do, and they develop special techniques. If you look at books on uh, memorizing, they'll usually have these techniques like uh, trying to look at the face, find a prominent feature, and then somehow hook that to the name. And once you practice it a whole lot, you can do it quickly. I'm not good at this. Uh, but some of them, you know, you give them 200, they'll get 100 or something like that. And so it's pretty amazing because it's, they're coming boom, 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 right? And we're just a few seconds of pain. And uh, so... Sorry to interrupt. But that's, uh, that's a whole other world. I mean, for most of us, just repeating the name, using what we call retrieval practice, 
repeating it immediately, but it won't stick if you're just repeating it immediately. You need to keep doing it off and on. If you're at this party and you look over at them later and think, aha, I met that person, it's Betty or whoever. And, and so just keep doing it uh, at greater intervals, and then you'll eventually make it stick more in long-term memory. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I guess just that process of forcing yourself to remember in a situation like that is perhaps the one thing that many of us forget. It's it's yeah. so obvious when you say it out loud that, okay, simply repeating it, remembering it, associating the name with the face is, is one of the most helpful tools. I've also heard, and to use the example of the memory athletes that you just brought up, that a lot of the time creating some form of a story around something that you would like to remember is a really helpful way. I, I often... I met uh, two people um, in, in my local street a couple of weeks ago. They just actually moved to where I am from the US. And uh, the lady's name was Chris. The, the man's name was Jay. And I, I, I thought I would just try this under no illusion that I knew it was going to be right. Um, I just associated her name. She doesn't look anything like her with the name Chris Kardashian. And he was Jay Leno. They both look nothing like the people, but yeah. I saw them this morning and uh, yeah. it seemed to stick in my mind. I was yeah. like, okay, no, I came up good. with this fun little name game. That's good. It, is there any science to back up the fact that that's an effective method? Because it seemed oh, to help absolutely. me at least this morning. Absolutely. Uh, if anything you do to elaborate, and even if you make up a crazy association like Jay Leno, um, then that's helpful. I mean, anything you do to make it distinctive to stand out. So uh, if you can look at them and then think of who you thought of, then you've got the name. So it's easier to remember two people in an image than it is a name and a face in an image. So I think that's a good technique. Yeah, it seemed to be helpful for me. I was happy because I've been trialing a couple of other things, as I said, which is why I found my way to make it stick that that mm -hmm. seems from my perspective to be the most helpful one but i'm also aware of the fact that maybe with name retrieval that's a a really helpful thing but when it comes to the actual idea of um, education or retaining information i know a lot of the time and i've heard you speak about this at length now since i found out about you but i know a lot of the time when i'm trying to retain information especially a lot of information what I'll try and do is I'll go back and I'll just reread and highlight and yep. um, maybe take some notes. And I'm constantly amazed at how bad I am at retaining the information, regardless of <laughs> how, well, I don't know if this is true. Sometimes when I'm more interested in a subject, it seems to stick more effectively. But if there's some basic information, uh, for example, one thing in my household, which my wife would be quick to tell you, is she'll ask me to do a job quite regularly and it goes in one ear and out the other. Mm -hmm. So, there are a couple of subjects that I've brought up there, but I guess uh, starting with the first one, when it comes to this information uh, memorization, when it comes to text or something that you're studying for, why is it that so much of the information that we take in and so many of the techniques we've been taught to prepare for a, 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 an exam or a test or whatever it may be are so unhelpful when it comes to actually retaining the information for long enough to actually be able to put it down on the test paper? Yeah, um, well... Uh... Some of the things we do, and, and we're even taught to do them, a lot of people talk about repetition. And repetition is great for learning, but it shouldn't be bunched all together. It should be spread out in time. And so space repetition is good, but if you read a chapter and you read it over again, immediately that's not going to help you much. You just read it. You're not going to pick up much the second time. Uh, you'll probably just let your eyes slide over it. And the other thing, uh, we confuse familiarity. You can read a textbook and think, well, I got all that. I understood it all. Uh, say a history textbook or something. It's not complicated. Um, and so you think you have it. And then if you go back what you highlighted or uh, marked in some way, you think, oh, you know, I'll, I'll study what I thought was really important. And then... Uh, you have read it and you've become familiar with it, but the only way you really find out if you know it is to ask yourself about it. And so, like when I have a student, my teaching director, I used to teach introductory psychology every year, uh, and students would come in after the first test practically in tears because um, they'd say, I got a bad grade on the test, but I studied and studied and studied. And I'd say, How do you study? And they would say, I reread, I highlighted. 
I reread my lecture notes, um, and I would say, well, look, there are all these key terms in the back of the book. Did you look at those and try to say, can I use this in a paragraph? Can I define it and tell what it means? Nope, didn't think of that. And so what you really need to do is to test yourself, and that does two things. One is lets you know what you know and what you don't know, which is important. That's what we call the metacognitive aspect of learning. And it's a very hard thing. Uh, you know, you read that book and you think, I know it, I got it, I just read it, I got it all. Uh, but unless you ask yourself questions, you don't, you don't really know what you really understood and will remember and what kind of went by you, like you say. Uh, and so what we call retrieval practice is one of the best things to do, to look at questions, to test yourself. You can, it's even good to, while you're reading, all it slows you way down to write questions yourself, like ones that might be on the test later. Um, and so why do people do this technique if it doesn't work in the long term? Well, the answer is that it does work in the short term. If you read a text passage right now and I give you an immediate test, especially if it's a multiple choice test, you'll do fine most of the time. Um, but, I mean, if it's pretty straightforward material. But in a week or two weeks, you won't remember the material. Uh, it's kind of like the name. You know, one second later, you might have it, but a week later, you don't, unless you work at it. And so it's the same thing with text. It's, um, uh, you need to, say, read the chapter now, make questions or whatnot, test yourself, read the chapter again. You'll pick up the stuff you missed uh, before the test. And so testing yourself in multiple different ways, short answer questions, essay questions, uh, flashcards, if it's the kind of material that will you know, be amenable to flashcards, not everything is. Philosophy is not, for example. Uh, so uh, you've got to adapt your study strategy to what works, as we talk about, and make it stick. But um, all of those things, any kind of way you elaborate on the text, when you're reading a paragraph, pause after it and say, how does this apply to me? How do I relate this to something else I know? Uh, and those things will be very helpful. They slow you down. I mean, a lot of students, I feel like they say, well, I've got an hour. i got to finish this chapter. So boom, 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 boom. They're just kind of zipping through the chapter without pausing to reflect and to let it sink in, take little breaks. Uh, it's hard to read straight for an hour. Take a little break after 15 or 20 minutes, even if it's just getting up out of your chair and walking around the room. Uh, take a little break and then come back to it. You'll be refreshed. Yeah, I think in a culture of productivity and efficiency, one thing which is often overlooked, and I say this from personal experience, is how well you take on knowledge and what's celebrated is how much information you can get through. If I speak to yep. someone and they say, hi, I read three books a week, in my mind, I go, oh my gosh, I need to improve how much I read forgetting the fact that even me trying to read one book a week at the moment yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that the information has been absorbed. Have, yeah. have, have you had much of an experience with that? Because I understand from a college perspective, which I've been through here in Australia, a, a lot of my approach at the time that I was going through it was just try and know what you needed to know for the test, um, get the marks that you need to get your certificate and then move on, which I'm sure says more about me than it does about the actual structure of the course. But what I found interesting was there were so many people who had that same approach. Let's just cram, take it on as quickly as we can. And then so much of that information in six months seemed to disappear. Whereas with this process of retrieval, stopping, slowing down, understanding what you're reading and how it applies to your life, it, it seems to, um, and, and I've heard you speak about this, it seems to have a far more effective capacity to stay on board long term when you've slowed down that process and taken these steps. Absolutely. So. I mean, some courses maybe you will think, well, I don't really need this anymore. Uh, but for many things, you don't know what you're going to need in later life, especially these days with people changing jobs all the time. Uh, and I certainly found that I still draw, uh, you know, I went to college 50 years ago, but I still draw on things I learned in college uh, uh, now. So I think it is important. Um, yeah, I think you make a good point for a lot of students studying like you describe, and that will fade fast.
Yeah, I asked my wife the other night, who's who's a, a really good teacher here, really passionate about it. She teaches history, and she seems uh, to have a far greater understanding on this subject than what I realised. Because I, I came home, I was listening to the Audible version of Make It mm-hmm. Stick the other day, and I got home from my run, and I, I asked her the question. I said, "Hey, what what is the most effective way for a person to learn, in your opinion?" And um, she went through a couple of different things, and and then something that she mentioned, which was really interesting to me. And I believe her based on how much I see her remember from the the books and things that she does read. One thing she likes to do is um, take notes, but more than that, she finds she's really benefited by pictures that she draws. Mm -hmm. And as she explained this, I thought, I wonder if that is in fact almost a way of retrieving the information because obviously to draw a picture about what you've read, you're going to have to go into that mind to retrieve the information that you've just developed. I don't know if there's much science around that, but I was interested to pick your brain around like this idea of journaling in a way that you're actually drawing pictures rather than just taking notes after you've read text. I can send you a paper on that very topic, but yes, uh, basically things that are, uh, we remember pictures better than words. If I were to give you a list of 50 pictures of common objects, say uh, uh, a uh, football, um, a uh, automobile, you know, just common things, and give one group the list of words, automobile, you know, basketball, whatever else, uh, and then give another group that same set of pictures telling them what I'm going to ask you later is for you to write down the words. So in other words, you, you give the word, the group you give the words to, well, they're, they're getting it in the same mode they need to write down. You might think they'd be better. But no, uh, you're much better if you get pictures rather than words, even if you have to recall the words. So uh, this has been known, and since the time, we don't go into this much in the book, just a little bit in one chapter, but since the time of the ancient Greeks, they've known uh, about uh, mnemonic devices and memory palaces. And so the basic idea of, of uh, let's say, uh, let me tell you about the method of loci. Um, this is uh, something where you have a list, a set of locations, say rooms. And if you have a house, uh, the places in your house, the front, the front sidewalk, the front doorstep, the entryway, uh, so forth and so on, all around the house. And if you have a set of things to remember, whether it be a grocery list or points you want to make in a speech or whatever it is, you simply arrange them and you put them in each place uh, along the way. So um, this is what uh, the American writer Mark Twain did for his speeches. He wouldn't use any notes. He'd use this method. Uh, And it works wonderfully well. Um, I used to do demonstrations in class when I taught the class of uh, challenging the students the first day to, I'm going to one of you make up 20 objects, just 20 concrete objects and then present them one at a time for about eight seconds at a time and try to remember them in order. And I would use a version of the method of loci. It was actually a a slightly different version. But anyway, uh, same idea. You have locations or and then you have uh, things to put in locations. So you form an image of the first word in the list and you put in the first location, second word, and so forth. And then you can, at the end, it's, uh, you know the locations. Those are your retrieval cues. And then you just, I usually close my eyes and then run through my locations and call out items in each location. And it, try it. It really works so amazingly well. And the students are amazed if I can get, uh, usually I get 18, 19, 20, but most of them would just get five or six. So. Here's this old guy getting all these, uh, and here they are not doing so well. And then they learn how to do it later in the course, of course. Yeah. From um, from a student perspective as well, I I like mm -hmm. that style of approach as well, especially to use the Mark Twain example. It's far more engaging, I find, to listen to someone who's speaking a little more freely. And just that process of association sounds as though it leaves a little room to be in the moment. You know when you have 
someone at the front of a room and you have to sit there and you can tell that they're doing their best to memorize a script and perhaps they've got a piece of paper there and yeah. I don't know a, a little bit of the mm. uh, a little bit of the energy seems zapped away from whatever's being yeah. presented when it's like that and I'm from the world of stand up comedy here oh. in Melbourne Roddy and and what I notice on a regular basis is when you have a newer stand up comedian you can really see with a lot of them um that when they're trying to recall a joke they're recalling it the way they'd written it down <laughs> and part of the magic of yeah. the joke is is just evaporated based on the fact that it's like, oh, okay, this is something that's being recalled. You're not right. You're not in the same yeah. room as us fully. Um, I mean, Mark Twain would be a, gr a great example of that. Always had a reputation for being quite an uh, entertaining figure, whether yeah. it was in his words or <laughs> in his performances and yes. speeches. So yeah. perhaps no surprise. So is that is that a way that you approach your lectures? Yeah, I try to. Uh, these days with PowerPoint, I'll have pictures or whatever up there. But I try just to point to them and not, you know, regurgitate what's on the slide because that's just deadly, reading your slides. And you see people do it all the time. Uh, but, yeah, you try to just use them as backdrop. That, that What you're saying is in different words than what's on the screen. Or at least that's what I show you. For sure, for sure. And I guess if you needed to, at least you've got the help of the photo to spark a memory. It is, it is. I mean, that way you don't need any notes because the notes are on the board. I mean, I've seen some of the slides so many times, I just glance at it and I can know what, exactly what you say. What are some of the biggest topics or the most popular topics that you lecture on? Uh, well, most of it's memory. Um, and often it's how to improve your memory. Uh, I mean, this is not in the class. This is one of mastery of talks. And you sounds like you've watched some of my talks, so that was probably what you saw. Uh, I've studied other things, though, um, like, uh, well, I uh, studied the, the topic of false memories for a long time when we have the illusion that we're remembering something, but really we're either remembering it differently from the way it happened or we're remembering it something that didn't happen at all. And uh, that's been... Uh, a main thrust of my research more in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, but that's one topic. Another one I'm doing, working on now, which I think is really interesting, is called collective memory. This is not memory like we usually think of it. It's more how we remember in groups, what we remember. It has to do with identity. So, for example, national memories is something I've studied. Uh, uh, everybody who's Australian, I assume, has some things they learn from history, some they pick up from the culture, their parents, watching movies, reading novels. So you've got, uh, you know, the, the Australian national memory. I couldn't obviously tell you what that is. And I've, we've got the American national memory. And it's not that every American has the same memory, I suspect. In fact, that's one thing that distinguishes if you ask, and we've done this kind of thing, say, people who are conservative and vote for President Trump, ex-President Trump, uh, and people who are more liberal, and you ask them what are the greatest events in U.S. history, and the list is somewhat different. Uh, the, the people who are more conservative start talking about Columbus discovering America uh, uh, and more religious things, how the pilgrims came over from England. Uh, whereas the more liberal people talk about the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Not that conservatives totally miss that. And not that, uh, and if you ask them, uh, if you look at negative things people bring up, genocide of the Native Americans. We were terrible to the, well, not me personally, but uh, terrible to the Native Americans, just like you have that same issue in Australia with the Aboriginals. Uh, and then, Conservatives don't bring that up. Uh, slavery, that's another one. Uh, liberals bring up the, the, the uh, tragedy of slavery, and conservatives hardly bring that up. So things like that. So we have slightly different national memories, even within one country. And you might find the same thing in Australia. For sure. For sure. I wonder, does that even apply to smaller things? I had a classic example this morning. Yeah. In Australia, um, I was, uh, sorry, in the town that I live in, I live in a, a relatively older town. I live in a town called Point Lonsdale. 
I don't know what the average age is, but there's a lot of retirees that come down here. So as a result, I've got a lot of mates down here who are in their 80s and, <laughs> and above. And uh, I'm sure some of our national memories are slightly different. But I had an yeah. uh, interesting conversation with a, a friend of mine down here this morning, and he's 82. And he was explaining to me, my wife and I have just moved to a new house and we're renting because um, the town that we're in at the moment, the, the prices are just preposterous <laughs> through mm-hmm. the roof. And uh, we, we told him that we'd moved house and he said, oh, did you buy or did you rent? And we explained to him that we're just renting for the time being, um, you know, because the price of the property is, is just huge. And he said, yeah, it's only going to go up, so you should jump on board. And I thought that was interesting and, and history tells us that's true. But mm-hmm. here in Australia, um, there seems to be, an obsession with this idea of home ownership and rightly so in in so many regards it's something that i'm sort of trying to navigate my way through and understand at the moment but this idea if you speak to anyone from my mum's age who's 65 and above even younger like this idea of home ownership is just a must if you're an australian and Mm -hmm. as they were explaining that to me i thought i wonder what the emotional tie with that is is that a purely monetary thing is it a security thing is it a story that they've created do things like that fit into the category of a a, a national memory because for so long if you got in in the 50s the the value that you made on that property is astronomical right yeah i would say that's certainly part of national character and the national ethos uh and probably a memory of their the older ones of their childhood homes and if most people grow up in houses you often want to duplicate you know, what you had. Uh, my son lives in New York City and couldn't possibly afford anything in New York City, so he rents an apartment uh, and probably will stay in New York the rest of his life and never own a home, although he occasionally talks about it. Uh, so um, it depends a lot on where you live. In, in where I live in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, home ownership is very common. Most everybody I know uh, on the factory here, owns a home uh, in one area or another. So that might be modest homes, but they're still you know, perfectly viable homes. For sure, for sure. The the idea of um, uh, just bringing back to childhood memories or the other reasons that might motivate them to want to see us in, invest in a home is one that's interesting and I guess comes under this idea of false memory in many regards as well. I remember on an individual level, I look back at times in my life with sort of sentimental eyes, but even mm-hmm. at times where I know I wasn't necessarily my happiest or I was going through certain stresses or anxieties, and in the time I knew for a fact that I wasn't necessarily that excited about where I was, but for whatever reason, I'm 36 now, I might look back 25 years and go, oh, back in the good old days. And yep. it's interesting that certain emotions seem to be forgotten when you're reflecting on a certain time in your life. So, for example, I know... There's a lot of people in the current day that they'll look at their situation and they might be cynical about where they're at or disappointed with certain areas or perhaps even upset. And for whatever reason, you fast forward 20 years and they look back like these were the good old days where everything was just going beautifully. Does that come under the category of false memory? Because I'm always fascinated about why it is that we look at the past in in many of our lives with such rose-coloured glasses. Yeah, I don't know there'd be a false memory. There's one finding that, I mean, this is is what you're describing is, uh, I don't know if it's worldwide, but certainly it's in the U.S. too, where a lot of research has been done, and England and Europe. But people um, seem to forget negative memories when keep positive memories. That uh, Certainly, unless you're a depressed person, clinically depressed. And so even if you had a pretty unhappy childhood, you can remember the high points, the good points of it. And um, so I think that's just because we tend to remember positive things and forget negative ones, perhaps as a defense mechanism of some sort, keeping us in check. But that's a very uh, uh, oft-repeated finding and very interesting. Even in, even in laboratory studies, uh, we give people positive words and negative words. They'll remember the positive ones better than the negative ones. When you try to equate the words on all kinds of other things like frequency and the language and stuff. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's interesting. My wife and I often, at the moment, we've got a three-year-old boy and a one-year-old boy. So as oh, a result, well. it sounds like you've got kids yourself. It's a, a yeah. chaotic, it's a chaotic household yeah. here. <laughs> There's a lot of yeah. emotions, and uh, and as I said, the the mm. age group of the people that we're around at the moment, they look at us and laugh and say, "Oh, you guys have got to take this take this on board. Like it's a really special moment. It goes by so quickly." It does. And I know <laughs> I'm old enough to know that 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 would be true. But even still, with the pooey nappies, the lack of sleep, the temper tantrums, yeah. you go, oh, surely there's not going to be much that you look back on <laughs> with yeah, rose glasses from yeah. here. But, yeah, I'm sure we will. Yeah. Hey, uh, what, one thing you mentioned before um, uh, briefly, and we've touched on a couple, is just the use of mnemonic devices for re- retaining certain information. Are, mm-hmm. there, are there certain mnemonic devices that are standouts when it comes to memory retention? Well, the uh, memory athletes all use something called the memory palace. And it's like the memory of loci that we talked about with using your house, except they have palaces that hold two, the reason they call it a palace is they'll have things that hold two and 300 and 400 items. And they won't just have one. They'll have 30 or 40 palaces. I mean, they can be, uh, uh, you know, hotels they've been to, all kinds of things. They deliberately memorize these places, big sets of them. Uh, and then they use those. They use imagery. They take in the information, sort in some particular location, and they practice and practice and practice. I mean, four or five hours a day doing this kind of thing. And so it's um, uh, not for the faint of heart. It's a very, it's a sport for young people. They age out of it in their thir- late thirties. Uh, so basically, uh, the World Memory Championships are held. Every year, usually in Asia these days, uh, it used to be all over the world, but now. And the Asian, uh, the uh, for a while, the Germans and the English were the best. Now it seems like uh, uh, North Korean guy is just amazing. Uh, they let him out to come to these competitions. He's so good. And Chinese are very good. Uh, Indians are coming on strong. Mongolians are really good. They have a memory academy in Mongolia. And I was associated with a memory tournament in the U.S. And they showed up here and they had patches all over their uniform. They wore uniforms. They had patches all over them advertising Mongolian banks and <laughs> Mongolian car dealerships and that kind of thing. So wow. it's a whole industry, a whole sport. If you Google World Memory Championships, you can see the records that they've set. Uh, for example, um, the North Korean guy, one of the tasks is what we, what psychologists call digit, digit span, number span. So just how many single digits can you remember in order? So six, five, four, one, three, nine, two. And now we can say six, five, four, one, three, nine, two. But the record for that, for saying hearing digits one at a time, one per second, which is about what I was saying in that, he could remember uh, 470 something of them in order, uh, and and how those memory palaces. He would do things like take every three digits, create an image. He would have an image for every three digits, put it in the first place, next three digits in the second place, and so forth. And I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna ask you about this because the idea of retaining memories over the long term makes more sense to me, like that. Yeah. Uh, time element that you spoke about yeah. makes a lot of sense. You want to remember where things are in your palace. Well, spend time familiarizing yourself with it. But yeah. then, as you just said, 432, I think it was, different numbers that you remember with one number per second. So are these people just operating at a much faster speed? Obviously, they've got the background of practice. They, they know what their palaces look yeah. like, I assume. They know where they're going to yeah. store certain letters. Is it the same thing just taking place on a, place on a way shorter time frame? Yes, it's the same principle, but they have, uh, they're all really smart. Uh, they all have what I would call high working memory capacity, the ability to hold things in mind and ignore irrelevant things. Um, that's working memory, working with the information in mind before it goes away. They, they're excellent at that. And they say, oh, anybody could do what we do. I used to have a bad memory, so I started doing this. You could do it too. And I used to believe that, but I don't anymore. I, I just heard so many people that started off trying to do this in a serious way, and they just gave up. 
you know, there's mm-hmm. some good. So I do think it takes some special talent uh, that the ones who are really good at, like the ones who compete. Uh, but in the U.S. and in most European countries, and perhaps in Australia too, there are competitions. Like in Germany, every city has their own competition, practically. And then they have a German competition once a year. Uh, the U.S. it's not that developed, developed that well yet. Yeah. They're trying to get better here. That natural talent's always a factor, isn't it? I come from a background in middle distance running, and I trained really hard. In fact, mm-hmm. I trained with a number of athletes who competed at the Olympic Games, and we had the same training programs in many regards. Mm-hmm. And while I got to a certain level, which was good nationally, on an international scale, I would have been absolutely blown out of the water. And, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. there's some athletes who who just seem to be able to take that work and, and take it to a brand new level. At, I was speaking to a friend of mine yesterday who's got a background in motocross, and he said the same thing. It seems every field that you look at, including yep. the memory champs now, seems to have some yep. just freaks of nature. How does that number retention convert to other areas? Are these guys and girls more naturally um, uh, able to recall information that they read from textbooks as well? Uh, unless they use the special techniques, they aren't. They, they tell us they forget their keys where they put their keys, they... You know, their wives tell them one thing and send one year and not the other. Unless they're using their special techniques, they're just like the rest of us. But if they use their special techniques, uh, and they claim uh, that they can't retain things over the long term, that, you know, they'll, if they use their memory powers, they'll get rid of it immediately. But we tested them one time. We had them memorize things on one day. And we didn't tell them to go test them on the next day. And they had this, oh, I'm not going, I can't do it again. And then we tested them the next day. And they forgot some, but they were still much, much better than our control people who were students who have mm. good memories. But uh, So they really do, as long as they haven't used the memory powers again, they can get back to it and they can remember much of what they originally had the next day. I don't know if they could do it a week later. Yeah. So the memory palace would be the number one standout mnemonic device that people are right. using? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I feel as though there's a romantic, uh, like you're almost romanticizing the idea of hard work. Like to go back to the idea of a college student, sometimes when we sit down with a textbook and we say, okay, I read this for five hours, I d-, it's almost as though we're trying to convince ourselves that we deserve to have a great result. And to use the example right. again of distance runners, it's not always the athletes who, who run the most miles in a week who win the most races. Mm-hmm. There seems to be a balance between obviously natural talent, the work that they put in, the strength work, also the recovery work um, that takes place, the sleep. Like There's so many factors. Yep. Um, so it's always a little bit of a shock when people find out that the best marathon runners in the world don't necessarily run the most miles. And yep. then when it comes to this idea of, of students in, in uh, test situations, how much of that is taking place, do you think? How much are these guys going, okay, I've put in the work, surely, um, you know, the, the universe has got to give me some form of good result, and they're not necessarily as interested in what the most effective way to approach their study is? Yeah, I, I think that can happen. They think if I've put in the work, I'll do well. Uh, but they have to put in the work the right way, and it depends on, you know, on the type of test also. Uh, students... Uh, often they're big classes in universities, say introductory biology or introductory psychology, uh, and most introductory anything. People give multiple choice tests because they're easy to score, hard to make up, but easy to score. And um, a multiple choice test, things so we can recollect things uh, and things can just look familiar. So there's kind of two different ways of remembering, if you will. One is recollection, that you're really sure I'm conscious of this, yeah, I remember this. In other words, in other cases, well, let's just look familiar on a multiple choice test. Here are four alternatives. Well, I recognize that one from somewhere. I'll pick that one. And often you're right, because familiarity can get you there. But familiarity doesn't help you much in recalling things. Mm-hmm. Recall depends on recollection. So if you're asking an essay question, being familiar, if you saw something, doesn't help you a bit. You need to be able to create a story, a theme, and put it all together. That's why practicing creating 
uh, or looking at, at the end of the chapter, uh, questions and trying to answer them after you've read the chapter and seeing how you've done, or making up the questions as you go along and then testing from your own questions. Those are so much better ways, especially if you're going to have an essay or a short answer test. Yeah, yeah. How much does the idea of... So there was an example, and I'm not sure if it was the chapter that you wrote, but there was an example that was given in um, in the book. There's a couple of examples that, that were really helpful to me. But one was about a, a hunter who had part of a bullet stuck in a valve in one part yep. of his brain. And uh, the story, and here we go, you're testing my uh, ability to recall this story at the moment, which is going to be good for me. Um, but essentially the idea was uh, the surgeon that he was lucky enough to see, he was obviously a, a, an elite level surgeon and worked with a number of you know great and important people from around the world. But what stood out was this surgeon hadn't just developed the ability to retain information because a, a surgeon who's just retained information and that's it isn't really good to anyone. You have to have a surgeon who's got the information but then also has the ability to implement what they've learned right. and hopefully for your sake over the course of many years. Um, I, I find this really interesting because often and especially when it's practical information, when it comes to me, I can watch a YouTube video and I have the information and then I try and put it into practice and I go, okay, there's a disconnect here. Now, how much does that implementation factor, and I guess um, as I say it now, it makes me realize it's probably just another way to recall information and just being put into place mm -hmm. practically. How much does that implementing what you've actually just started to learn add to the speed in which you learn that that skill? Uh, it adds an awful lot. And one thing. Um... Doing actions, actions are remembered better than just instructions. So the experiments being done, uh, where you hear a statement, like pick up the mouse. And so some people actually do pick up the mouse off the desk. Other people just hear the statement. And a third group hears the statement and imagines performing the action. And what you find is if, and then you do this for a whole lot of different objects. Um, I used to do these kinds of experiments and we had this whole array of toys, essentially, little soldiers and little whatever. Uh, and so uh, if you actually perform the action, you'll remember it a couple of weeks later the best. If you imagine doing it, you remember it next best. If you just hear the statement, and then you do the worst. And, and what your, the test is, you just read the statements and you say, did this happen two weeks ago? Uh, and if you acted it out, you remember have it, You remember the statement better, uh, even though you, you heard it also. I mean, you heard other statements. And so performing the actions really helps. And so in learning like from YouTube videos, well, the first, you're probably not going to watch a complicated video and get it all the first time. You just need to slowly go through stopping it performing the action, and then speed up and get better and better, get the sequence down, and then you'll probably be okay. But uh, people learn actions and motor skills typically really well. And, you know, you see that kind of expertise, like in, say, automobile mechanics, that uh, they just didn't, you can't just read about a car in a book and expect to be a mechanic. You've got to practice over and over and diagnosing and all kinds of things. To be a really good mechanic. Yeah, yeah. I was um, I was involved for a couple of years here in Australia on the stock market on a, a day trading level. So I was, uh, <laughs> and that was the right noise. That's probably the noise that came out of my mouth more than ever in, during those two wow. years. Um, but that's my best example. I, I think I can think of when it comes to actually taking on information and then trying to cross that information onto a live market and understand what the data that you're being given actually means. But then not only, like there were so many different facets to the learning and to the practice that were taking place. Mm -hmm. Obviously you had to have some idea, especially in day trading of, of what a particular uh, a, a bar graph pattern type meant. Like what does yeah. this mean? What does this suggest? What are the odds that it's gonna go in a particular direction? What does it say about the psychology of the people trading here? But then more than that, there was the actual uh, technological side where you had to try and figure out how to put the trade in at a fast enough time at the right time, how to get out at the right time, yeah. control the emotions. And that 
felt like a very tiring, especially for, no, probably first 18 months because my head was often clogged. It felt difficult. It felt hard. I was often, I would come out of this office and just feel confused <laughs> and frustrated. No. And uh, I often, I say all that to say that often during that process where I learned an incredible amount, I often felt at the end of each day that barely anything had been learned. And it was a really frustrating experience. How much is that a process of people learning? Like, is that difficulty supposed to be there? If you're doing it right, is it supposed to eliminate that difficulty? I think, uh, so if you go back to the surgeon example, the way, uh, one of the points of that story, which I think is a great one, is that what he would do after each surgery is he would reflect, what did I do? What went right? What went wrong? What could I do better next time? But when you're day trading, you don't ever have a chance to pause for reflection. It's just, as I understand it, I've never done it and mm. don't plan to. It just goes <laughs> by you too fast. Yeah. Uh, so you probably have difficulty learning because of that. You need to slow things down, think hard about them. I mean, you could, at the end of the day, probably go back over some of the trades you made and look at them more slowly and more carefully. But probably, as you say, you're just exhausted at the end of the day and that's the last thing you want to do uh, is go back and look at them again but that probably would be more effective for learning yeah it's interesting you say that because a lot of professional traders say that's exactly what you should do so i didn't even oh. mention that during the um during the process of the trades i was actually recording the screen and my audio and i'll try and speak through each situation for exactly the reason you just mentioned because oh. you're right um uh, and then journaling. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting just to hear how well that does correlate to to what you teach. Because even journaling is something you have to go through. You have to you had to rate from you know A to F on the entry of your trade and the exit of your trade, um, the volume of money that you put into it, um, and then you have to explain the process of thought that was taking place. So uh, I think that was that was part of the reason I um you know, without going too far into everything that I do, I had a business that was already working. I think I saw dollar signs and I saw some professionals doing really well in it and they made it sound easy. They were also selling courses coincidentally, <laughs> which <laughs> could have been could have been part of my downfall. But I, I think I got excited by that and I forgot that like every uh, area in the world, if you're not going to put in the work that's required to, to get a bit of a foundation and to become good at it, it's probably not worth it. And I realized I was I was probably kidding my time and that energy was was better off used um, used somewhere else. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, the thing I was curious, and I don't know whether this is sort of going out uh, to a field that's not solely yours, but I was curious to know whether there was any correlation between memory athletes and the use of their brains and reduction in things like dementia. That's what actually a friend of mine, Nelson Dallas, his grandmother got Alzheimer's and he watched her go down. And that's when he took it up. He said, I want to get so good that if this happens to me, I'll last longer. My memory will last longer. That was his motivation. Uh, and he became U.S. champion three or four times and placed in the, I think, top 20 in the world championship once. He's a computer scientist by, by profession at the University of Miami. Um, he'd be a good person for your interview, but many yeah. athletes, if you want to, he's very, very personable. What's his name, sorry? Uh, Nelson Dallas. I can send it to you. Uh, That'd be great. His website. Um, he also has a book, of course, so he'd be happy to be on. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, no, it's an interesting world. I, I haven't been part of it for a while now. And I was studying these people. I wasn't participating. I've just... <laughs> Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, the the other thing that I was curious to find out about was okay. So we've got our mental palaces, the mnemonic devices, uh, obviously that that come mm -hmm. along with that. But outside of the actual uh, practical mental skills that you can practice, mm -hmm. are there lifestyle factors around diet, nutrition, sleep that so many of these athletes are, are doing at a high level? Uh, yeah, uh, Nelson's. Uh climbed up Mount Everest several times, so he's very physically fit. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, um, some of them take it very seriously. Others, there's a guy named Ben Fridmore from England. He has hamburgers all the time and doesn't seem to take care of himself physically. And 
the time I knew him, he lived in his parents' basement. He was an accountant. Uh, he would just go to work as an accountant when he needed to, and otherwise he would practice these mental exercises. Very nice guy. He was a lot of fun to talk to. Uh, very well liked by the whole community of memory athletes. He's probably retired by now, I guess. But yeah. uh, anyway, they just come in all shapes and sizes. <laughs> uh, uh, one's a lawyer, one's a psychologist, so uh, but they do all kinds of things. Sounds one like was the world a of... medical student, and the medical student said he learned about this and decided to do it to learn all these medical terms, and medical students have to learn every system of the body, the skeletal system, all the muscles, nervous system, all that. So it's just a huge task of memorization, but you really need to know it. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the, the medical field as well, because the medical field is one that I, I'm really curious about. I'm, I'm very interested in, in both how medicine works, and I'm also interested in hearing how uh, more natural approaches to health takes place and the correlation. There's often a little bit of a stigma attached to, you know, the, the naturopath types that they're a bit hippie, a bit woo-woo, mm -hmm. have no appreciation for medicine. And the flip side of that, the more academic side, is that there's not a real appreciation for the body's ability to heal itself for the impact of exercise and nutrition and diet and is mm -hmm. more of a focus on, um, you know, perhaps just the power of medication, which is obviously uh, uh, difficult to argue with. We've seen so many amazing breakthroughs there. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, one thing that uh, sort of just came to mind, as you, you mentioned, the medical field there is a lot of the time you go to a, a doctor and they do have an amazing ability to recall certain amounts of information without a, a good awareness or a good understanding of you know other approaches to um, mm -hmm. health that might be able to be used is there a, it's i've got a brother-in-law who's who's asperger's he's, he's on the spectrum and he's very good at um uh, you know memorizing certain things he's got certain fascinations with certain objects but then when it comes to actually be able to apply that day-to-day -day, um information in a, in a really practical way, there seems to be a, a little bit of a disconnect there. Is, is that, um, sorry, I've thrown a lot of information at you there. I think I'm formulating mm -hmm. my question as I speak, but is is that like a little bit of a trait with some of these memory athletes that you see? There's there's almost that uh, crazy ability to recall, uh, retain information, but then when it comes to an actual conversation or just day-to-day -day conversations, is, is there a little disconnect or is that not a common trait? As you said, no, it sounds like there's a common a lot trait. Of... Uh, they don't seem to be on the spectrum that I can tell. Uh, some of them are a little unusual, but um, <laughs> I'm in academia, so there's lots of unusual people. Uh, so, um, the, uh, but no, they uh, don't seem to be on the spectrum. And some people say, oh, you must have a photographic memory. And they say, no, no, not at all. And uh, I've asked them, do people show up at your tournament saying, oh, I don't use these techniques you use. I just have a photographic memory. And they said, well, one guy did uh, in England uh, one time. There was an English guy who showed up at the memory tournaments there. Uh, but nobody believed him. They all thought he was using the techniques. And he wasn't all that good. So he didn't seem to have really a photographic memory. And I've never found anybody who I thought had a photographic memory. When I used yeah. to teach introductory psychology, it was always somebody's aunt. Oh, my aunt has a photographic memory. Or so-and-so I know. Uh, so we'll give them this test. Uh, what, what do they remember really well? Oh, things on a page. They can remember, you know, what was at the top, what was at the bottom. So I said, okay, they really can photograph it, yeah. So I said, go give them a page, just one page, any page you want, and tell them to photograph it. And then give them the following test. Tell them to go 10 lines up from the bottom and read the letters from right to left as fast as they can. Well, if you have a real page in front of you, you can do that easily. Nobody can do that. They can't read the words either on the line. So they're really, uh, and they're other more fancier tests, but there just isn't a photographic memory. I mean, people, you know, there is a normal distribution of memory. Some people have very, very good memories. Some people have very good visual memories. But it doesn't mean it's a photographic memory. We're being a little too generous with the term photographic yeah, memory. Very generous. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting how we do that. We sort of, uh, uh, well, there's two interesting things to what we just said. Often when we 
watch a person who's doing something at a really high level, we're really quick to attribute something like photographic memory to them because maybe it helps us separate ourselves from it, not feel so bad for the fact that we can't do it. But but also the flip side of that is interesting that when you speak to someone with an incredible talent for that kind of thing, they tell you that, no, I've got nothing special about me (laughs) in particular. Um, Yeah, it's it's interesting just to see that that disconnect between, uh, you know, depending on what perspective it comes from. Um, I wanted to ask you about, as I mentioned, I've got a couple of young boys and the the conversation around how we're going to do their schooling is starting to sneak in. Like we've got a couple of years to the side on the fence about whether we send them to a local school or whether, you know, with our powers combined, perhaps we look at homeschooling in, in some capacity, whether it's, you know, full-time, part-time, we don't know. But I often hear parents speak about when they ask their kids, oh, what did you learn at school today? They'll say, oh, nothing. And obviously no. that's not true. They're just, it's a laziness or it's a disinterest in the conversation. I'm sure there was something learnt. But I asked my wife if there was any questions that she wanted me to ask you in particular. And one that she had was she was curious to, uh, to hear your thoughts on when it comes to introducing a, a new idea or a new concept to a kid. Like think of a traditional school sense. Maybe you're going to sit down and teach them reading or maths or whatever insert whatever before they start that subject they might not realize that they're they've got an interest in it or a knack for it Mm -hmm. um they might not realize that they enjoy it so they're quite hesitant to actually get involved in learning it Mm -hmm. is there is there anything that you would recommend to get a bit of a kickstart to get your child engaged in actually starting to learn like whether it was an emotional cue or one of the mnemonic devices or um I was just curious to know how do we actually invite them through the door to start to learn on whatever subject it is we're trying to introduce? I think um, one of the most important things, which is uh, research backs up to, is reading to your child, getting them excited about books. Uh, Here's a whole world of things and that you have to read it to them, but this book contains this wonderful story. And... Uh, certainly, that's what got me going. Uh, and then I went to public schools uh, uh, as I uh, growing up, uh, one supported by the city, the state, uh, until I uh, went away to high school. And the, um, but my parents, when I would come home, my mother in particular, uh, uh, and there were four of us. But she really took an interest in our education. Every night we would talk about what we did. If I had a spelling test, I remember like in second grade, uh, I was goofing off apparently, and I, I don't remember this, but my mother t- told the story uh, that they went to the first parent-teacher conference, and uh, my mother would ask me, do you have any homework? And I'd say, oh, yeah, I've done. And she went in, and the teacher said, "I well, never does his homework. That's why he's making bad grades. And boy, that was the end of that. She was <laughs> on me. Uh, and we did, she tested me on the homework. I wanted to see it every night after I'd done it. And we would talk about it. And, you know, um, she, if we, I had a test coming up, she would quiz me like a spelling test. She would give me the words. I would spell them uh, until I had them right. And so I, and we had whatever year it was, spelling test every Friday. Uh, so all week long, every night I'd be getting those words. And so other things too, like math. She was good in math. Uh, she would help all of us if we had struggled with math homework. So, uh, and that was really helpful. So it was kind of like having homeschooling at night and day schooling during the day. And that way I got to meet a lot of friends and do a lot of stuff. But I think for parents to be uh, really involved in the kids' schoolwork, especially the early years, and then you, as they figure it out and as they become self-reliant, uh, at least in my case, they could back off because they knew I was going to do fine. So, uh, but to me, reading to them and then just staying involved and um, I think I, I don't know much about homeschooling, and there are all kinds of different ways it's done now in the U.S. Um, sometimes in kind of groups where the families get together, and different, uh, typically mothers, but sometimes fathers, you know, will teach this subject, and somebody else will teach that subject. So you get a little of rotation, 
but you're not in a formal classroom, but you do get some socialization with other kids. But anyway, public school was fine for me. We had class sizes of about 25, and that was not a bad size. Yeah, that was my background as well. And I had, it's a big debate in our, and not a debate, it's a big conversation because I've got such great memories of the friends and things that I made at school. Yeah. And we were kind of uh, leaning towards what you just mentioned there. If we were going to do it, there's quite a few homeschool families in, in our town that are, um, they, they get together on almost a daily basis and there's there's quite a few. So that social aspect is something that, you know, I'd have to figure out a little bit more. Yeah, it's still yeah. a big conversation. I'm not so, because as I said, I uh, I got great memories from from where I was at, and but I've also heard some great stories on the homeschooling. So I guess it's just, yeah. uh, hey, watch this space. Just before I let you go, Roddy, is there um uh, is there any coaching or anything that that you do with these professional athletes, or you were doing it more from the academic sort of science I, take we were on just studying them? Yeah, observing yeah. them. I, they wouldn't come to me for coaching, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> they do just a totally different. They're on a different plane. They've read lots of books about. It. They talk to each other about. It. They're each other's coaches. It's a very friendly community, even though they're in competition. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a very interesting world. And we don't talk yeah. about that much in the book, but I hope your listeners will buy Make It Sick. Because uh, we didn't talk about a lot of the things that are in the book tonight, but um, it's done very well. And we're now working on a second, um, not second edition, but a second book. And what it's about is a lot of stories of people like teachers who have adopted the techniques and make it stick. And especially I just was reading today about a math teacher who was struggling and students did okay, uh, but the next year they didn't remember much. And that was because they were teaching this blocked manner they do, you know, fractions here, percentages there, something else. And so people had these in silos. And they started mm. teaching, as we talk about in the book, in an interleave manner where you mix everything up and you keep coming back to it. So they don't just get fractions once and assume, hey, I got that. But you keep coming back to it all year. And uh, he had great success doing that, even though it was kind of a rocky start because the students were saying, hey, I don't get this. But you have a little practice on fractions now. You come back to them later, come back to them yet again. And by the end, you've got them because you've got spacing and you're mixing all these different things up like they are in the real world. Uh, and so, and like on the test, they don't have things blocked in little categories on the test. You have to figure out what you're doing. So uh, anyway, we're working on a second book about oh, all exciting. the successes for Make It Stick. Uh, for, if you have another minute, the... Uh, uh, Harvard Medical School revised their curriculum, and we interviewed the uh, deans of education of Harvard Medical School, and they said we basically based it on make it stick that when we give our first uh, slideshow to the incoming medical students, uh, the picture of make it stick is like the third slide, and they suggest read this book. This is what we based our curriculum on. And you'll see all this kind of interleaving. It won't just be the nervous system, then the muscular system, then the skeletal system. You'll be learning all this stuff together because you'll be using it all together when you're eventually a doctor. So that's uh, that's uh, such good news. That would be a chapter in the book. <laughs> oh, that's that doesn't surprise me at all. It's uh, I'm I'm really excited. As I said, the reason I reached out to you was because uh, I I already just the information that I'd uh, taken on from what I'd read and watched of you was was really exciting to me, and it's a uh, sort of sparked a new project in my life to make sure I improve this. So uh, I'm excited, especially to know um, that educators, academics out there are starting to, uh, or not starting to, perhaps they've done it for a little while now, but there's a fresh take on on how students might learn more effectively. And I mean, from my own perspective, as I said, the, the pumped up feeling that I got through reading it is I'm sure being mm -hmm. spread through millions of people. Do you know, do you know when the second book's out? Oh, we're just written the first two chapters, so we got a sure. while, maybe three yeah. or four years. Uh, maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll reach out to you again, and we can we can sure. do a little update soon. But sure. um, just for for everybody listening, I'm going to make sure I've got make it stick um, in the show notes to the description to this episode. Okay. So for anyone who's interested, um, yeah, make sure you check that out. But man, hey, so appreciate you you making the time yeah. to come on. It's been a, a really fun conversation. Yeah, well, I enjoyed it. Good to, Thanks good so to meet much. You. Yeah, yeah, you too. Bye -bye. See you, Roddy. See you later, everybody.